which is in, which in, in most of the instances uh, targeting coaching others and the 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 the, the very promising um, allocation of what's your role um, in the interventions that are taking place system uh, wide. So this is how it goes. And if you go, if you um, want to have a look on how we read these, so how you're going to self-assess uh, regarding each of those levels of the milestones. So if you pick one of those here at the middle of the level, this means that you have already demonstrated the behaviors that are relevant to the previous one, level one and level two. If you are at an intersection, this means that, for instance, here, you have demonstrated those milestones for level two with only some of those for level three. One of the beauties about those competencies actually is that they do not only focus on the essential roles of a clinician, educator, or teacher, but that they consider the context of practice, which is quite important. The quality of the learning environment, the well-being of the educator, the learners, the colleagues, um, the diversity, equity, and inclusion in the learning environment, and how to mitigate your biases, and the beauty of having change management added to the administrator role, because actually, in many instances in medical education, while there are trends, new trends, best practices, but the idea of having a leader who can uh, lead the change is not always well known or well achieved at the level of the institutions. So actually, I can see, I can foresee um, um, a lot of opportunities uh, for the start of reaching system-wide interventions, solutions for many of our chronic issues and problems in medical education, like for instance, burnout or DEI. So we thought what would be the best way for you to experience those uh, milestones in uh, maybe by now you're asking yourself, where am I actually along the journey of being a clinician educator? And what are my competencies? What are the areas that I might be looking for improvement in, et cetera? So we have prepared for you um, a survey, a self-assessment survey. I'm going to post uh, the link for the survey uh, in the chat box, and then I'm going to share with you my screen to show you, to walk you through the survey and we're gonna come back to, to discuss this. So I'm gonna stop sharing now here. So we'd like you just to begin to just get a feel for these competencies. This would be a self-assessment. None of your data were reported individually. Um, so certainly we need to um, have your thoughts on the, this document after you complete it and get a feel for it. So is it in the chat now? Yeah, it's in the chat. Sorry, it's in the chat. Can you, uh, are you able to log in? Could to people log in that in the chat? Can anybody? Yes, I'm, yes, I'm able to get in. It's done. Okay, so that's great. So uh, this is the survey that we have prepared. And uh, as uh, Alice has mentioned, here, all responses are kept anonymous. This is a self-assessment exercise just for demonstration purposes. So how does this work? Here you are expected- We chose educational theory and practice because we felt it was one that people have been engaged in already. So it would give you a sense of how to progress. Yeah, and exactly, and we've added one for well-being and one for leadership skills uh, to, to give you um, a view of what the, how the other competencies are looking. So for, for here, uh, please select the level of milestones that best describes your relevant knowledge, skill, and behavior as they relate to this competency. So you're going to have the drop box and select amongst the levels. For simplification, we have put here not yet completed level one, and then a selection of level one, two, three, four, or five, which means that you're gonna select the level stone, uh, the, uh, the level of milestones that you have already demonstrated and not the ones in transition. So please, uh, we're gonna have like uh, six minutes, like one minute for peer competency and try to do as much as you can of these. And then we'll discuss.
How's everybody doing? Good. It was pretty quick and easy to fill out. I like it. Okay. <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, any, uh, any other comments? Are people ready to comment on this? Uh, uh, Alice, we've got here 18 responses so far. So, oh, right. Uh, I know. Um, okay. How is going to share? I forgot. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> now I'm going to share her, the responses. And I think um, Laura, you put in the chat that you're having a workshop at the AEC to help you self-assess, develop, and make a commitment. The AEC stands for what? Just so everybody's clear on that, Laura. Apologies, it took me a minute to get to un unmuted. Um, the annual education conference that ACGME holds, it will be mm -hmm. in Nashville the end of this month. Oh, oh, I that's the ACGME conference. I'm yes. sorry. <laughs> that's okay. Right. I'm saying, uh, Laura, oh. I'm I'm attending and I'm attending the workshop. By the way, <laughs> fantastic. Great. Okay. Are we ready to share, Doctor Kamis? Uh, we're going to give them just a couple of minutes, and, and we're going to share. While we're waiting, if you're done, any comments on it as you experienced it? Hey, Alice, it's Monica Lipson. How are you? Monica, <laughs> so nice to see you. Thank you. For Dude, I, I thought it was a great tool. I, I, you know, it's interesting. I could foresee using it more like we think about using remediation for residents, right? If you had a particular faculty member with a, you might perceived a deficit in some area or an area where that person wants to sort of improve on, it'd be useful to send that piece of the, the self-assessment to them to have some dialogue. You know, I, I worry about if you had to do all six competencies. No, and I don't think it's meant to do all six. What it's meant to do is to pick where you wanna go in your career. I mean, Laura could comment a little more. And the idea is, you know, there is the DEI competency if that's where you're going or you're going in the leadership area when you think about all the post um, CPD type programming, Ethan Freed's on here. He completed my master's program. It has three stool, three legs to the school. One is teaching and learning, just like these competencies. One is leadership, and one is research and scholarship. So you have to see where you're going to progress with your career. Yeah, Alice, I completely agree. Uh, the really our intent was not for anybody to try to jump into this and, and do every single one. Right. It's pick one or two that you feel the strongest about that, you know, that sort of as your own personal goals and, and jump in and, and try to assess yourself, create a learning plan and move forward. If you've got a young, or if you are a young faculty member and you think you want to be a program director um, or a clerkship director, if you're in the UME space, um, you know, to, to think about, okay, what do I need to improve on? You know, probably some of those administration skills are going to be really important if that's, if that's a goal of yours. Um, if you want to be an educational scholar, right? Again, pick the, pick one or two at a time. We, we don't want anybody. <laughs> to try to do all of these together. Well, in a lifetime, you never know, but- In a lifetime, sure. <laughs> but I just want to mention um, something Laura said that's really important. Um, if you're looking at a faculty member's career trajectory and they say, well, how do I become an APD? How do I become a program director? I do this a lot in my mentoring. You could say, look at these competencies. These are the things you need. Um, that's great. First, uh, um, uh, thank you for all the comments in the chat box. I'm I'm quite happy that you're finding this uh, user friendly. In um, it didn't take much time to complete, so this uh, this makes us happy actually. So um, let me share some of the findings. In uh, of course, we don't have a lot of time to go through all of this analysis and do interpretation and inferences, etc especially that we're not having any demographic data about everyone. But I want to share a couple of comments um, because we have uh, piloted this before with, uh, within our um, Masters of Education at Hofstra University for 
uh, the retreat we can we've got almost the same i think um comments so first to start with when you look at something like teaching and facilitating learning this can be a, a tool for mass screening so now for the people who are with us up here now we're having like 60 uh 36.4 percent as experts in uh, we're having on the other side uh, the majority uh, residing at levels three uh, if we've gone to the, the curriculum, uh, we would uh, find more or less nearby uh, uh, percentages, except for maybe we're having more at level one here, uh, educational theory, et cetera. And, and when you go for something like programmatic education, and actually this is a command, uh, this is a, a, a remark that we have seen uh, multiple times that maybe programmatic evaluation, because not everyone is performing program evaluation, and because maybe the higher levels at the program evaluation milestone needs you to be involved at institutional level, we would find that the majority would like like at the level three, and, and those who are experts in the area would be like at the level 14.7%. For the well-being here, we're having um, well-being of learners and colleagues. Uh, I would consider that, that, that uh, having people like 40% at level four and five at level three, this denotes uh, the um, emphasis that is taking place uh, currently on the topic in uh, how to combat burnout for the leadership skills. Uh, we're having again, like at level five, we're having 22.9%. Uh, and for level three, uh, we're having 34.3%. And again, as we have mentioned, and as Laura commented, we're not expecting everyone to be an expert in all of the domains. And we're going to comment about what are the factors that would shape or would help you to figure out what competencies that you want to uh, focus on and uh, at what level. Another remark that we usually find when it comes to uh, the individual responses, because when it comes to the individual responses, you would find usually some differences. Uh, here it's lying between three, four, and five, and at level two. And this denotes actually what we have been saying that it's not a must that everyone would be reaching like level four or five, or that you progress along the continuum of the milestones for each of the competencies uh, would be the same. Um, having said so, um, we are to return to uh, our discussion. And again, I would like to thank you all for the contribution. And I'm glad that you found this useful. So um, moving forward comes the, the, the big question. And um, Alice is going to um, lead uh, uh, this part of the discussion with contribution from myself. But the idea is that um, we have worked together on development of a list of questions for our discussion today to help us think about this big question. Alice, would you take over? Alice? I'm sorry. How can we use these milestones in your work as an educator or leader in education? Does anybody have any thoughts? We're opening this up for discussion. We can have a couple of thoughts and then we're going to go to the detailed questions to help answer this overall uh, big dilemma. <laughs> if you would like to write in the chat, that's fine. If you would like to uh, join the conversation and, and tell us your opinion, you're welcome. So yeah. uh, um, go ahead. Identify uh, yourself. Son. Yeah, uh, myself, Dr. Chinmay. I am from India. I am from India. Hello. Yeah, what you, we yeah, can, can you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So actually, I am thinking that we can use these milestones, which has been uh, nicely designed, to know the present level of educators, the baseline level, that what level they have right now. And then we can uh, focus on how they can improve it. So basically, to start with, uh, we can have a... Sorry, we lost you. Should yeah, we, hello. We lost you for a minute. Yeah, so we can use this for a background check. Great. That's great. So you have a new faculty that's coming on. What is their baseline? 
or you have somebody who um, you feel you want to make sure they have what their skill levels are so you could have them self-assess. That's great. Mary says faculty career development. I think that is my goal with the, so Mary, I agree with you, faculty career development, really important. This is a way to give people some foundation on what to do with their career. This is so important. People are floundering, like how do I, I meet many mid-career people in my mentoring circles and um, that I'm in, and the hardest group to mentor is the mid-career. And this is a way to say, okay, what road do you want to take? In fact, I had a call this morning with um, pediatric um, neonatologist at Northwell, and he said, I want to build the next stage of my career. And I said, well, what is your goal? What is that? And he said, I don't know, but I, I need to build it. <laughs> you know, like, I'm like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> let me think about this. <laughs> And obviously he's a good clinician saving babies' lives, but he wants to do something else and he needs to plan for that. This tool is a great tool to help people. Um, survey my faculty using a survey for the purpose of faculty development. Lisa, thank you. Um, identify my roles and the gap in my performance. So I think that's really interesting. I, I'm not gonna say your first name correctly, so I'm afraid to say it, who, who person who said that. Mina Tala? Mina Tala is. <laughs> yes, that's a great idea to self assess yourself. Ethan, you're bringing up succession planning. Can you comment on that <laughs> as a concept? Just it just came up in a discussion with my chair yesterday and you know thinking about developing my my uh, junior faculty into more senior faculty and Thinking about who you know, who to uh, uh, begin thinking about um, taking over even my my program. You know, should that should that time come? Right. So, how do you do good? Um, here, I have a very young person commenting. Hugo is in um, a fellow in a Gen Ed um, fellowship, and he's also going to become a very very strong clinician educator by July. So he has a short run to that. And he says, I think it would be an interesting way to standardize OSTEs and even for 360s. This is amazing. At least I'm doing some education right that he can make this comment. And um, he is saying that some of this could become a checklist if you're running OSTEs. I run OSTEs with chief residents and I didn't even think of that, Hugo. Uh, brilliant that I could look at these criteria for some of my OSTE checklists that we do with chief residents. And they focus a lot on leadership skills for the chief residents, and there is a leadership category. Uh, Alice, I think we uh, we should be moving for the okay. next question to keep some of those uh, okay, excellent let me comments. It says assistant identifying <laughs> your own level and try to help colleagues. Yes, so yeah, I think we have an overall sense of the value of these, not to be scared of them. I've heard a lot of fear, like you know, who's watching us, type thing, Laura. So to demystify them. Um, so how can these reframe faculty development? Um, this is something we're greatly involved in at um, Zucker School of Medicine. What are our faculty development needs today? You know, this was greatly impacted by the pandemic, for sure, faculty development. And what are the needs now for people? Um, what are the real needs? So anybody have any thoughts on using this as a needs assessment specifically? Anybody wanna open up the mic? There's no restriction here. <clears throat> Hi everybody, my name is Mary McBride. I'm at Northwestern. It seems to me that this can be an opportunity to assess where your faculty are. And then the very logical next step is then where do they wanna head? and these give you kind of a stepping stone down that trail of, you know, how can you then move them from point A to B to C and help them develop their career based on their own interests and the needs of your institution. But I'm relatively new to this circle and thought process, so I would love to hear what the rest of you think. Anything specific for undergraduate thinking about UME today? Someone brought up UME. I think these are very attached to UME roles today. 
even though it's put out, but remember AAMC was behind this, the osteopathic school was behind organization. This is not just um, an ACGME effort. Uh, regarding undergraduate medical education, um, I, I think the, the ACGME clinician education, uh, educators milestones uh, supplemental guide is quite helpful because it lists uh, examples of professional tasks, um, assessment methods, and they are categorizing these as per the level. So you're going to have, when it mentions you, this is for undergrad, and then it is G, so this is for grad, and, and then it is for continuous professional development. So there is a role for this and to have some guidance of what type of activities would be suitable for each of the levels of education along the continuum, the supplemental guide is a useful one. So um, one challenge is in the chat, uh, there is Minnatalla, um, uh, sure one of my challenges uh, in conducting a faculty development program is that faculty members are unaware of the roles and their level of performance in teaching. So this could be used as a pre and post assessment of behavior changes in response to faculty development programs. Uh, so it could be used when you run a faculty development program. Do you, did you move anybody in their trajectory? You know, if you run something like I'm going to a hospital this afternoon and I'm going to run something um, related to learning environment. So did I move people in their understanding of learning environment? That's just an example. Um, want to go we're to the having, next slide? Yeah, we're having just another comment from Suraya Qattan. I think it can be used as needs assessment to see how faculty see themselves. And I think most tend to rate themselves on higher ratings and are not completely honest when reflecting on their own performance. This can then be used as a guide for peer evaluation in uh, grass. I, I think this is a good point to consider the peer evaluation is one of uh, the voluntary peer evaluation is one of the uses that are mentioned uh, for this tool. Uh, reflecting I, on... I just want to say at that comment, I love the way that you use growth mindset there, so I want to congratulate you. I'm a firm believer in growth mindset and okay. reflecting on one's own performance and using growth mindset. So that concept, I haven't gotten there yet. That's the growth mindset, the yet. And you can get there if you put effort in it. So thank you for using that terminology. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Qattan, uh, the, the one who posted the, the comment actually is a um, colleague and expert. She's got the PhD in, uh, in assessment and evaluation. So um, thank you, Sarai, for, for the comment. Um, as we move, I wanted to share with you something that we're currently working on and we started piloting it. Traditionally, when we're doing targeted faculty needs assessment, but I've done this for years as a director of faculty development at the College of Medicine as, and as the chair of the faculty development committee of the American College of Surgeons, AIs, that we are traditionally, we're looking at previous training and experience, existing competencies, current performance behaviors, perceived efficiency and learning needs and preferences. And although this has been uh, having value on how things are going on, However, we're currently trying to reframe the way we're looking at uh, needs assessment uh, when it comes to faculty development. So we are currently considering professional identity. This is quite important. Who am I? What are my roles? How do I see myself? And where along um, the professional identity spectrum do I lie? What do I want to achieve? And we think that Identifying your professional identity is quite important. In the last retreat, uh, I used Professor Forneri, the identity quakes uh, survey so that people can uh, see where, what identify, what are their professional identities, uh, what are uh, the types of support that they are gaining from their institutes, because this is one of the important factors and what's the degree of engagement at your own institute. So starting with uh, something to, to see what's your professional identity and who am I, and then getting to do this type of self-assessment would be quite important and helpful. The question that we have posted uh, during commenting on the survey that we have taken now, the type of self-assessment, and the question that came up of if I'm having different level, levels of uh, competencies in uh, I'm level one, for instance, it one, at one of the competencies like curriculum and at the other, another one like assessment, maybe I'm at level three, what would determine 
what are my targets? What are the levels of milestones that I'm looking to achieve? So I think that knowing who you are, what's your professional identity and what are your rules would be helpful in determining which competencies at what levels you would like to go on. So um, this is one way that faculty development is being reframed. Alice, the next question. Um, how can you use the milestone data to curate available faculty development resources? So this is interesting um, because we do need resources to run faculty development. So for example, um, Hugo nicely brought up the use of OSTEs. OSTEs are objective structured teaching encounters that apps, and I use these for leadership encounters as well, mentorship encounters. I use OSTEs all the time as much as I can, but it's an, it's an expensive resource. I need standardized learners. I need a clinical skills lab. I need cooperation of staff. So how can we use this data to think about other resources? Sending people to conferences is a resource itself. So can this data help people have a development plan, which Laura mentioned is gonna be part of the workshop at the educational conference and think about what resources we can cultivate based on these. Any thoughts on that? Or actually hiring people to do work, you know, that's another resource. Um, Al, hi, Alice, Deb Simpson here. Hi, I Deb, thought, nice to see you. Thank I you. I thought, why not um, use some of those sources that are places that are already available and just have their IT people tag them? So whether it's MedEd Portal, um, the ECGME's uh, learning platform, uh -huh. so right. that we don't have to reinvent, because there's plenty of resources already out right so you know, you're right we have to think but, how to collate the resources that are there um well i think they could just be searchable by that or pull downs or right. you know put some yeah. meta tags on them and let that be able to pop up as a header and people could find them if they're searching for that um, I I don't think we need more platforms or more resources. I think it just needs to be smarter, and that's an expensive process. So how about the organizations that are already doing that, since they're, many of them are the sponsors of this uh, report anyway? Right. Uh, Any people that, have thoughts on that comment from a very yeah. experienced educator? Uh, that, that, uh, this is very thoughtful, and we're going to share with you some ideas in the next slide of how to do this. And I'm, I'm happy that uh, we're having this same vision about how to do this. And I can see in the chat also, uh, Dr. Umayma Hamid, Professor Umayma is mentioning um, faculty development programs should be prioritized to be able to optimally utilize the available resources or partnering with others to complement each other. Um, so that this is one way. This is one way uh, of, of seeing um, how this uh, the, the suggestions that you have mentioned can get into reality. So um, what we're looking for that maybe an Amazon style recommendation paradigm. So for instance, if we're having a number of open resources or resources at your institute, and I'm giving here one example from um, my John Hopkins account as I teach curriculum development there in the Masters of uh, Health Professions Education. So when you go to select uh, what, what type of courses you want to attend from the course catalog, you can select by delivery type, like blended learning certificates, et cetera, by category, by provider. And I expect by the coming years that we can have another drop list, drop down list that would include uh, the clinician educator milestone levels. So when you're doing your self-assessment and then you put this here, you can find the number, a uh, number of uh, um, suggestions or recommendations for what courses might suit you. So Deb, as you have mentioned, maybe we uh, later on we can be asking people who are developing courses to mention that they are suitable for which levels of those milestones. So that uh, can be used as a quick screening uh, and a matching between how do I assess myself or the results of my uh, peer evaluation and the type of courses that are available. And I think this would be very useful because many times you might enter into a course and start and then you're not quite sure of if this is the right one for me. 
Um, right. That's great. And obviously, Ethan, what you're saying that not everybody's going to get to the expert level in these competencies. Um, so Dominic made a very nice comment here about iLearn. iLearn is a Northwell product. I don't want to, I know there's people from all over the world here today. And our iLearn system, I know, is being looked at by the new chief learning officer we have to improve that as a platform of resources available to the Northwell network only. So I apologize for that. We have an internal learning system, but certainly I'm sure many places do. And to look at your learning systems and see if they meet the needs of these competencies, um, certainly I know our iLearn system needs to be expanded to do that. So thank you to just bringing it up to remind me, Dominic. And um, I would like to uh, read the comment of Dr. El Badri. Thank you for this important um, uh, comment. I think based on the results of the faculty training needs and review the available resources, we can identify what extra resources and logistics need to be available. A very valid point. If we do this type of mapping between what we currently have as resources and what are the needs of uh, our faculty as identified on the spectrum of the uh, levels of the milestones, this would be uh, a, a, a tool for not only target needs assessment, but for environmental needs assessment and what type of resources that we are lacking. Um, it can also be a, a helpful tool to target cost-effective approaches and to have more, I think, of uh, return on investment. Um, okay, so we're going to go to the next question. How can these inform self-assessment? I think we've discussed this quite a bit. But for annual reviews, that's interesting. And then individual development plans. So Laura mentioned that at the conference in Nashville, they'll be doing individual development plans. What's interesting, um, we do a self, we have annual reviews at Northwell, where I'm sure most people do. And coming up with individual development plans is always a challenge. So perhaps, um, what can I say, using these to guide the plans that you need to make. So for example, if someone says, I really want to work towards being a, you know, uh, a teacher at the medical school, what plans do they need to make? Or I want to really focus on learning how to do research in this area. So I think it's natural. And I don't know, other people have made comments around this for annual reviews. Any other additional comments? Because we've had some. It may you can do this efficiently, um, certainly quite efficiently by completing one of these. Um, a let me comment see. here. Yes, I plan to share with my promotions committee. So we haven't discussed this for A and P uh, academic promotion. What are people thinking? That you could open your mic. This might be an interesting end of conversation a little bit going for people who want to be promoted. So um, I'm going to call on Marie Patricio, who's a good friend of mine. Marie, are you there still? And I'm not sure maybe she got off. So Marie Patricio was just promoted to an associate professor. I congratulate her. And she plotted out her career as a, um, she's an allergist immunologist and then moved into medical education at the undergraduate level and more recently at the graduate fellowship level. And I'm just thinking how these milestones could impact her promotion to associate professor more recently and then going forward to professor hopefully one day. I'm not sure. Uh, and, and just to fine tune the, the discussion a little bit that it is mentioned as uh, um, in, in, in the presentations of Laura Edgar and on the website that these are mainly for formative, for self-assessment. So how can we still make use of these, although they are not used as summative tools for making decisions? Yeah, I don't see Marie. She must have gotten off. She was on earlier. I'm trying to think. I've served on promotions for six years myself as a member of the promotions committee and I'm a senior member because I am a professor. And the idea of explaining to promotion people who are not familiar with education as a promotion track, 
let's get it straight. It's not the most common thing in promotion committees, research, clinical research, bench science research. I was there as a voice to constantly explain to people what educational research is, what educational leadership is, what it means to be known by educational organizations, um, very important. Um, so I think this can certainly help promotions committee. So I really um, appreciate that. Up, um, Laura, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, so you're right. We we didn't design this as a as a means for you know sort of a formal evaluation. Although we know that there will be institutions and programs who use it that way. However. I think that this can serve as a really strong basis for your portfolio. Um, and it's something that uh, I'm seeing a lot more uh, junior faculty starting to do a good job at developing. Um, and you can use these various areas as, you know, and if you sort of think about, you know, as you create your learning plans, um, which you can actually use the supplemental guide to help you with, build into the portfolio how it is that you um, educated yourself in these areas and include what it, how it is that you assessed yourself, whether it was you used um, evaluations that came from your students or uh, feedback that you got from your program director or your clerkship director or you know whoever, um, because then you're spelling out if you have a committee that doesn't have somebody like Alice on it to explain the value um, of these educational, um, you know, pieces. By doing it in the portfolio way, it it shows it right there. You know, you can show that you're you're uh, aligning yourself with this national criteria. Um, that uh, again, it, it can all it can do is help. And I'm no longer on promotion, so um, what can I say? I'm counting on other people. Six years was the max term, and I'm not there, but I'm, I'm, counting, I'm counting on colleagues to do that because I must say, people just like, what is this? Where do they belong? What are they doing? People just don't know. Good to chair, share with chairs and PDs and other leaders. Yeah, because to get promoted, you need a chair's letter. So a chair really has to understand if you're going under the education track, what this means. So definitely chairs are very important because they're the beginning of the promotion process. Um, next slide. Um, uh, ju just a couple uh, of interesting uh, comments in the chat that I wanna share. Uh, so we're having from uh, Dr. Elbaz, she's mentioning that it could be used for doing some sort of matching so between uh, the, the programs, the faculty development activities that we want to deliver and uh, the competencies of the available faculty to deliver these. So whenever we're having someone who's like expert or having a, a high level on the milestones uh, spectrum, we can have them uh, to deliver certain type of courses. Um, also, uh, John Laurie is mentioning chairing with the chair, program directors, and other le leaders to, to do the guidance. And um, I will take it over from the comment of uh, Dr. Payar, who's mentioned self-assessment would help identifying areas that need improvement when we can develop our own self-development plan and find resources and opportunities. I, I continue... I, um, I totally agree with you, and uh, I foresee this as um, you're a mentee, you're having a mentor, and um, you're starting building a trajectory towards your clear goals and roles. So where do you lie along the spectrum and this trajectory? You build it over time, and it helps in having an overview about your progress. So uh, when we look at the uh, Dreyfus model, again, we can have a, um, some idea of what are the lines of development that we're going through. So for instance, for the novice, they are always sticking to the rules until uh, you progress and get to the mature experience to use your intuition more. When you're a novice, you're considering everything. And when you turn to be an expert, you have this type of relevant focus on what really matters. When you start as a novice, you are a detached observer 
and you end up as an expert to be part of the system and uh, in influencing the outcome of the organization. So having those trajectories, I think, would be uh, quite helpful. Um, uh, maybe also I would comment on what Alice mentioned, that maybe your those who are evaluating you, or maybe your mentor is not a, an expert medical educator. Uh, you're a clinician educator, and maybe your mentor would be knowing somehow of some things about education, but they are not the expert ones with all the areas, so I think it would be helpful uh, in, in this essence. So the, the final big question, Alice. So we're not going to answer this question. We're leaving this question with you. How can these impact institutional approaches to gathering program evaluation on system-wide initiatives? How can these impact institutional approaches to gathering program evaluation data? So somewhat of a QI process on system-wide initiatives. Um, Ethan Freed is our QI system-wide person here. So how can these do that? We weren't planning to discuss that. We're at the last five minutes and I wanted everybody to take a moment if you could put in the chat and just put some final thoughts how you're feeling about today's presentation, just go to the next slide. Until uh, you put your comments, uh, can we ask uh, Laura, Dr. Laura Edgar, by as we conclude this uh, um, journal club about um, this very interesting uh, new and uh, expected to have a lot, lot of influence in uh, uh, improving how medical education, health profession education is being, is being conducted in uh, the, the system-wide level that is expected at the different institutes with this piece of art that we would like to thank the ECGME and all the contributors uh, for developing it. Um, we would like to hear a word from you. <laughs> and then could you go to the next the slide, process. please? Could you just go to the next slide while she comments? Thank you. Um, uh, let me just say, for, for me personally, this was a bit of a passion project. Uh, for those of you who, who don't know who I am, um, I serve as the Vice President for Milestones Development. Uh, so I get the pleasure of working with every single specialty, and I actually see a few names up on the, on the participant list who were some of my uh, volunteers on some of those specialty ones. Um, but as somebody with a doctorate in education, um, this is something that I have always felt really strongly about um, is that for many, many years, we have expected physicians to teach, assess, provide feedback, and do all these things without any formal education. Um, it was just sort of, you know, you saw how, how your mentor did it, now go and do the same. Um, but I have seen a change. Um, in the last 10 years, the number of, of physicians who are getting a master's in education um, are has just keeps growing and growing. And so I, I feel this sort of paradigm shift happening. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm determined to bring back that old word. Um, I'm feeling the shift coming in medical education. And it's going to be tools like these milestones that even for the folks who maybe aren't formally seeking that education, they're going to see these in different venues, and hopefully it's going to help them to realize that they do need to learn more. Um, in some cases, they might realize that they actually know quite a bit, that they had some great mentors that taught them the really great ways to do these. Um, so I I also think that this is going to have a big impact on faculty development overall. Uh, and I think there's going to be a lot of different ways in which uh, programs are going to implement this. Um, and it's, again, it's going to become hopefully a little more regular, um, even at the ACGME level, which of course is where I can talk the, the, the most succinctly, um, we have a requirement for faculty development, but we don't say how much or what specifically it has to be on. So hopefully this will, again, be a, a way to, to even help those programs and those institutions identify those faculty development areas um, to be able to, to help their faculty overall. Um, so I have a lot of hope for this. Um, you know, if, if you ever have any questions, 
don't hesitate to reach out to us at milestones at acgme.org. If you're going to be at the annual conference, um, I will not only do we have a several sessions, um, but I will be in the milestones booth, uh, or the milestones hub within the ACGME booth. Um, so you can feel free to stop by and say hello. And uh, again, uh, ask any questions you have. Thank you so much for uh, reaching out and inviting me to join today. Thank you for joining us 100%. Um, we'd love to have the representation. This is a survey link to comment about today, please. Um, our next one is March 7th, and it's on core and trustable professional activities, another topic to ACGME. This is not this is not planned like this, but it just seems to be important for entering residency. Most recently, a 10-year report came out on preparing students for entering residency. This even seems more important as we uh, have omitted the um, Step 2 CK exam. So this even seems more important today, more front and center. I have two people from our institution presenting on this. So you're welcome to join as well. If you're not on my mailing list, um, which I usually don't do such an outside push, I'll make sure that I get this out. And the survey monkey is appreciated. Um, the survey link, um, if we if you undo this um, full screen, um, just go to the last slide and then bring it down. I'll put it in the chat. Um, someone asked for it in the chat. Um, so just go to the slide, be bring it down, please. Oh, sorry. Um, so I can you get need the, the previous one. I need the link. So I need it not in full screen to do that. Okay. I can't take the link if it's in full screen. Okay. Thank you. Could you, could you put that link in, um, the sure. chat? Thank you. Yeah. Any last comments? Um, let me see what the chat is saying. I want to make sure I'm saving the chat. I, my era, I started the recording late, so it will be a partial recording for this one. Thank you. I've had a lot of positive comments here. So, Laura, you should be thrilled that people seem happy for this select group that's here today. And um, thank you for spending your hour with us. Um, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, and um, I'm happy that we had um, a nice representation from different countries, uh, uh, different levels within the career path, different opinions. You're having basic science educators or having clinician educators. And the last word, Laura, that people are asking that basic science educators would like to know if they are able to use these. Uh, any ideas of developing a list uh, that would incorporate basic science educators? Absolutely, this can be used for basic science educators. These are these are really core educational topics. Um, you know, there may be one or two that feel a little out of sync, um, but the majority of them can be used by by any educator. Uh, so, thank you for for this comment. And um, uh, actually, uh, I would like to thank you all for uh, this valuable contributions. The lot of ideas and um, the comments that give us the sense that there will be some action taken at the level of the institutes. And uh, actually this makes us uh, um, very happy. Alice can thank you enough for the opportunity to join you in another activity. Always uh, a pleasure and um, a learning experience to go with you. Thank you. Right, thank you. Thank you everyone and have a great day.